Hey there, listeners. Malcolm here. And on today's show, we're bringing you part two of my conversation with Mr. Albert E. White about African-Americans' lesser-known contributions to the modern Internet. For those of you who haven't already heard part one, I suggest you hit pause right now, go back, and give it a listen. You hear about how a small minority-owned company Albert White was a part of was responsible for issuing web addresses to the public and for two whole years between 1993 and 1995 effectively controlled access to the Internet. And for those of you who have already listened to the first half of this story, welcome back. I pick back up with my interview with Al right after this. Welcome to the Tech Money Podcast, where the worlds of technology and personal finance collide. Hosted by certified financial planner, speaker, blogger, and self-proclaimed personal finance nerd, Malcolm Etheridge. Each episode aims to make you just a little bit smarter about your money, all from the perspective of the tech professional. Without further delay, here's your host. Okay, so so Al, just to recap the conversation a bit, right? You join Network Solutions, I believe it was 1991. They make you a vice president of communications for the entire firm. You guys then win a contract from the federal government that positions you to be the sole entity responsible for giving individuals access to web addresses. Then you pick up some steam getting folks to sign up to access the Internet. But since it wasn't cheap running the business and you weren't selling these web addresses for much of any. Well, you actually weren't selling them for anything. You guys weren't allowed to. You run into a a cash crunch. Then you go out looking for capital to keep the lights on long enough to prove the concept and generate some revenue uh, selling these web addresses. And that's where we left off a conversation with AT&T that would be pivotal in this conversation. Let's pick up there where we left off. You guys were meeting with the the folks at AT AT&T. They had just established a venture arm. You told me uh, to see if you could convince them to come in as an investor and provide you with enough capital to take advantage of the opportunity in front of you. Right. They eventually agree to put up some cash through their venture arm to help fund you guys and keep the lights on. About five million dollars, I want to say, from reading the book, but there were some terms. Talk us through that. So, AT and T knew of the service because they had a contract with the National Science Foundation, helping with the uh, security and the infrastructure for the internet. Mm-hmm. And so, when we won our contract, there were two other contracts it offered out, and. Um, uh, AT and T was one of the winners, so they knew the importance of what we were doing. They felt that they wanted to help us. They did give us a commitment for five million, but one of the conditions they had uh, stated to us was, in their due diligence and reading our financials, they saw that a number of the owners had taken loans out from the company to basically to pay for their to pay for their their living expenses and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. they were concerned about that, that the five million that they were gonna give us was not going into the company. The owners decided they would not accept that caveat and said, we can't take the money because we need some money ourselves personally. Wow. And so that fell apart. When I look back at that, after 30 years, that most likely was one of the biggest mistakes we made because that would have bought us time to convince the National Science Foundation to allow us to charge a fee. The period right after the uh, company was sold, the National Science Foundation did al- allow the new owners to charge a fee. And that's, that's my, my real concern. That's something I, I think about every time I, I think about what happened and revisiting all those things that could have changed during that period mm-hmm. of time to keep the internet in the hands of the African-American community. Which is, is is huge. And I would I would add to that uh, a sidebar, uh, the importance of keeping good books right as a business owner, for one, that that's what's coming through what I hear you referring to. But then also keeping your personal and your business expenses clearly separated. Right. Right. Uh, and then also keeping your personal overhead low enough, especially in those early years, that you don't need to draw such a high salary that it chokes off your ability to reinvest in the company's growth, right? Because I hear what you're saying. It sounds like a very short-sighted way of thinking about the opportunity in front of you, which 
you know, we'll get into a little bit more in this this part of the interview. But I just as I hear that, right, I hear you've got a multinational conglomerate that's willing to invest five million dollars in helping you seize this opportunity. I have to imagine if you're able to sort of neutralize that burn rate that we talked about, where you've got a million a year coming in and two and a half million a year going out. And you're able to neutralize that a little bit over a, a few years using that five million dollars. I have to imagine there's more where that came from, right? Because obviously AT and T sees the opportunity here; uh, otherwise, they wouldn't have been in the business they're in. And so it, it it hurts my heart, and I had absolutely nothing to do with this this conversation and this equation. But just to hear that's the reason that uh, you guys ultimately had to walk away. It just that that's amazing to me. Yes. The the other part, Malcolm, is is that uh, you might have read in the book where I had a personal negotiation with Emmett, Mm -hmm. the chairman, Mm -hmm. who's a personal friend of mine, and um, tried to convince him that he and I should buy out the other partners Mm -hmm. and take the company forward. And that discussion really went nowhere. It just, he said, no, the partners need money and we need to go ahead and sell the company. So that... That was, that's another point that really kind of, when I think back at the time of, of trying to keep it in the African-American community, I was very hurt by that, that we couldn't have yeah. purchased that. Today, we, today that, that wouldn't even be a question. Um, as, as many people who are in our community that have the resources, I'm sure we would have gotten money to do this. I would have cold called my way to Serena Williams for you to get to, right, get you exactly. the cash you need, <laughs> to get you the cash you needed to make that happen. Um, yeah. I, I, well, that's why I, I, in, in our previous episode, I focused so much of, of the, the point I was making on the fact that even in 1993, there were so many, not necessarily to the level they are today, but so many prominent black business people. Black enterprise was a thing. Earl Graves wouldn't have had a magazine if there weren't prominent black right. business people up and down Wall Street and everywhere else actually making things happen. And so I imagine uh, there had to be people who could have and should have seen the opportunity for what it was and had the longer term vision to be able to say, like, we need to maintain control of this thing, because as long as the flow, the access depends on you coming to NSI as the gatekeeper, we can set the price for whatever we decide it's worth. Like that to me is the, the, the crux of this whole thing. If I wanted access to the internet, I had to call you guys and ask for permission. Right. That to me is like an invaluable resource. I'm sure we could put a value on it because we, we will later on. And <laughs> when we talk about the various uh, the subsequent sales, but it just, yeah. So anyway, not to, not to beat the, the, the dead horse there, but I, I just, that's part of this story that was just so amazing to me that I was like, I have to have a conversation about this on the record, get the story out there so that more folks know it one so that credit can be given where credit is due. Right. But then also uh, as a somewhat cautionary tale of, the effects of thinking in the moment and not necessarily like seeing the bigger opportunity for what it is. But uh, so, so to, to come back to the story you're, you're telling, right? So the partners decide to go ahead with the sale and they sell a hundred percent of network solutions to SAIC, who's one of the more prominent government, con- government contracting firms really back then and now, right? I believe SAIC right. was even publicly traded back then. So you can imagine how well capitalized they must have been. Not AT&T yep. capitalized, but they were well capitalized. So they swoop in and buy network solutions. How does that happen? How does that part? So so let me just clarify a couple of things. First, um, mm-hmm. uh, SAIC was an ESOP. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it was owned by its employees, SAIC claimed that they didn't know that much about the internet, but they knew about our federal contracting, and mm-hmm. they were interested in having conversations. At that time, there were a, a number of minority firms that were selling their their companies to larger federal contractors. So Mike Daniels, who worked for SAIC, was meeting with Emmett and the partners, and the discussion focused on, well, what would be the valuation, what would be the price? And during that conversation, Mike stated that, yeah, we're interested in the federal contracts. We don't see the Internet being a big thing. And so we're going to give you $5 million. 
The five million dollars was not even in cash. It was uh, they gave him ESOP stock. Mm-hmm. So in effect, mm-hmm. SAIC bought the company for no cash. Mm-hmm. The only thing they had to to assume assume was the debt of the company, which was around ten million dollars. But they they covered that under their own line facilities and stuff. And in the book, so they you took- point out that this was a fundamental flaw with this deal from the side of network solutions. Can you say a little more about that too? Well, you know, what, what I tell business people today, you know, you, you're gonna sell your company, keep 10% of the company, keep mm-hmm. 5% of the company, don't sell 100% of the company. And a lot of people have come to me later on and say, Al, you're right. We sold 100% of our company, the company doubled in size and we really didn't benefit by it. And that's, you know, that's a truism in, you know, real estate and anything. Just keep keep some equity in the company even if you may not know what the future will hold at least you get yourself an insurance policy that if the thing does blow up like network solutions you'll mm-hmm. have a piece of it so 10% of network solutions after the sale would have been worth 260 million dollars or something around that <laughs> you know and i and i've said that to the owners in the past i said listen we should have kept you know should have kept the, a percentage of it and stuff so that was the big thing. The, the the interesting thing is that the internet, if you remember during the dot-com boom bus period, mm-hmm. the sale took place in 2000. That was in the, the boom bus period of the internet. And so there were companies out there that were coming to the market with internet-like technology, and they were raising money overnight. And I think I mentioned it in the book about my work with Safeguard Scientific how people mm-hmm. at lunch would be getting checks for you know their companies and stuff, and I'm you know I'm sitting in 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 um, the office at Safeguard, and I remember the morning that the guys came to me and they said, "Al, did you hear the story about Network Solutions being sold?" And like I had something to do with that, which I didn't, and they said, "Yes, the company was sold for twenty one billion dollars, the largest sale of a technology company ever." Obviously, even though I wasn't an owner, I felt a part of it because I was a major member of the management team and Emmett Mm -hmm. was a close friend of mine. But that really hurt me to to, to see how in five years that they took a company that was formed by African-Americans, had the premier position within the Internet, and that company now is is sold to a majority company for $21 billion. And we didn't really well, benefit because Emmett and them did not hold on to Ed Network Solution stock. They get, they sold all the stock in exchange for a SEIC employee stock. So what I thought was important, and, and pardon me for interrupting, but I, I, I wanted to make sure that I double clicked on where I knew you were going with that point, which was the importance of owning equity in the thing, right? That's a very common recurring theme for this particular podcast. And so anybody listening probably already knew exactly where I was going to go uh, with my interjection there. But I just wanted to make sure that I pointed out to your story. This is about 30 years ago that we're talking about now. And even then, it was the importance of owning equity in the thing that you built and we're going to continue to help building. Right. So you as, uh, you know, one of Dozens of employees would have benefited from the ultimate sale of this company every time it changed hands, basically, if you had own, uh, uh, been, uh, been, been offered stock in the company. And then also the owners who created this thing and, and fell into this opportunity would have also benefited longer term because they potentially still be owners of, uh, uh, what's it, network, network solutions in its publicly traded form now. But I want to actually go back a little bit before you started putting numbers to it, because you said something that I thought was very interesting, which was that uh, at the time, SAIC was saying they didn't really see the value in the Internet. They saw the value in some of the government contracts that you guys had, and that's why they were interested in the sh- in the sale. So so that's what they're saying. But then ultimately, just two short years later, following the sale from Network Solutions to SAIC, the company gets spun spun out publicly spun out into a publicly traded company at $25 a share which places a valuation on the company now at nearly 4 400 million dollars so for a company who doesn't really see the value of this little internet thing you guys are doing that's losing money to 2 years later take that same company public 
at four hundred million dollars of valuation. Uh, what am I missing? What, what what am I missing here? Right then, in nineteen ninety nine, two years after that, they turn around and do a secondary offering that values the company now at seven hundred and eighty million dollars, which is almost double what they went public for. So in four years, they took this company that they said was worth $5 million, didn't really have a whole lot of value in the internet space that it was in, took it public and generated $800 million almost worth of value out of that company. How is this possible? This is a company (laughs) that could barely rub together $5 million four years ago. So what changed? The big change is is that six months after Network Solutions was sold by Emmett and his partners, the National Science Foundation approved Network Solutions charging a fee. Mm -hmm. And once the company was able to charge a fee, then you could see what the potential was on a revenue base. That's the big difference. And then the, you know, at that time, the network solutions was starting to take off. We were issuing hundreds and thousands of internet addresses a day mm-hmm. at a fee base of about $30. So that's what SAIC leveraged their public offerings on is what the potential would be for network solutions if it continued at the trajectory of being able to sell internet addresses to the world. And the price and of power. How- Right, right. right. We're well, talking well, about uh, a, a, a company that controls access to this new public utility that everybody's just now finding out they need access to. Right? Exactly. So you set the price. All of a sudden, it costs you more than the fifty fifty dollars a year that you're charging, or the hundred dollars for two years that you're charging. You now have the ability to just increase the price. Right. It was a monopoly. Yeah. That that's again. I'm reading this story, and I'm just blown away at the here and nowness of the 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 story and the decision making because i'm you know i'm obviously thinking about it once again through the lens of somebody who grew up with the internet and so i obviously can see the value in the internet cuz i saw it as it was becoming a thing and i saw i i see what it is now right we're we're having this conversation in our virtual studio thanks to the internet being what it is I, i'm not that's not lost on me but i also just just you know, I, I'm I'm also leaving out part of the story. Let me go back to that. Right. You were talking about the dot com uh, bubble of the 2000s. And so I, I was up to the point where SAIC takes this thing public at four hundred million dollars. Then two years later, they do a secondary offering at seven hundred eighty million dollars. And then in 2000, to your point, SAIC turns around and convinces VeriSign to pay $21 billion for network solutions. Now, obviously, that thing was hyperinflated and had no business being valued at $21 billion, right? I understand that. But my point in all that is, if you were a 10% owner, as you just laid out as your advice to the to the companies, the founders that you counsel today, if you were a 10% owner in that at the time that network solutions got sold to VeriSign, right, you're a billionaire. That's the part of the equation that like, so I'm reading this and I'm, I'm seeing the buildup. I see the blocks falling into place and I'm reading and I'm reading and I'm saying, well, at least the silver lining I'm sure we'll get to is that the four partners of Network Solutions, at least they walked away with a few million dollars themselves and, you know, probably had yeah. the foresight to work out and earn out and a few hundred <laughs> shares of the newly combined entity. And and then I keep reading and I get smacked in the face and I'm like, oh, man, no, no way. So it. Yeah, it, it, it's one, a tough, yeah, one, tough pill to swallow. Yeah, one of the, one of the, in, in fact, the sad story is, is that one of the owners went bankrupt. Wow. Today, you know, and um, so I had to find his address to send him the book and everything. But um, the, the other owners, the other three owners, there were four owners, and they're doing fairly well. But you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. obviously, if they had waited. Taking the eighteen T money, it would have been a different story. Maybe they wouldn't have gotten twenty one billion, but they would have gotten the sizable amount of money. Yeah, you know, and that's, well, uh, and that's go ahead. maybe they would because we're talking about a time when I hope this isn't the case, but maybe it's a time like we're seeing right now when companies were so overly inflated in value that things were out of control, and if you had twenty one billion dollars 
to throw at an acquisition, you needed to throw it at, at, at that acquisition to show Wall Street that you were actually doing something with the money, the free cash flow that you were generating and not just letting it sit on the sidelines. You had to convince shareholders that you were being aggressive and actively involved in M&A and everything else. And so we could say maybe they wouldn't have been able to grow it to twenty one billion dollars. Maybe they would have, though, because that nineteen ninety five to two thousand period was insane. So right. who knows? Right. But just to have and they, an option and they, to even do it. Right. And they were the monopoly. Just think about that. They were the platform. If you were going to do anything in the Internet space, you had to have an Internet address. <laughs> and and they were the ones that were controlling at that time until GoDaddy and some of the other people came in later on. But you could always point to that. If you want to get through the door, you got to come through network solutions. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and they got to get through Albert E. White, right? Because you're right. the one out <laughs> making the pitches with your, your, your slide decks and everything else, making people aware that this is a thing, then making people aware of where they got to go to find it. But yeah, it, it, uh, unfortunately, this is not the one and only version of this story. Right. I've read right. in the past about how uh, people like Dr. Omar uh, Wasau, right, the founder of BlackPlanet.com, who I know, you know, personally, right. has had a, had such a hard time fun, fa- finding funding for his little known Internet message board with, you know, I say little known in air quotes because they had over three million active users in 2002. This dude famously taught Oprah how to use the Internet on live TV, and he's left with no choice but to shut down the site because he can't find funding. Yet MySpace comes along. And raises nearly $40 million in 2004 for a very similar looking platform. And then we all know what happens in 2004 when Facebook comes along and basically invents what we now know as a social network. So uh, my question and all that thinking and, and, and all that buildup is simply how much of the missed opportunity that was network solutions prior to its eventual sale was due to short sightedness of its owners and how much of it was maybe due to intentional systemic barriers that were in place. Because it sounds very suspect to me that a company is only worth $5 million in certain hands one day, and then a day later it's worth $21 billion. Yeah, I think it's a combination. I think your latter point is industry, the marketplace itself, different mindset, number of minority firms were building technology companies. We were more in the communication space like Bob and and Percy and some of the other people, but we didn't have that acknowledgement within the general industry that we were technologists, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, like we have today. We have a lot more technology companies that are minority owned. So it was questionable if network solutions being owned by African-American group was something that people would latch on to going forward. And I think that it made it difficult for some of the investors to kind of accept that, that if this is such a great technology, and we've had this asked of us, this is such a great technology, why is an African-American company managing it? Which was harmful, just harmful to our, you know, to us in general. But it was something that I say in the book is, we deserved it. (laughs) There was nobody else in the world that could do what we did and develop the platform. It's not that we won the contract. We won the contract because we were competent and we understood the technology. We had developed this platform for the federal government in the, in the, at the Defense Department. So when it comes down to, you know, a lot of people say, well, you were a minority firm. They gave you the contract. No, a lot of people mm. did not know we were a minority firm at yeah. the time. We won it yeah. because of, of, of the capability of the company. Well, and frankly, this... Know, Go ahead. Finish your thoughts. Sorry. Yeah. So that's so that's, you know, what I you know, I've had a lot of time to think about this, you know, with the book and everything. I had to revisit everything. I had to revisit statements that were made, you know, and I had to revisit myself. Al, you you, you talk about this, but you were there. Why didn't you take advantage? And, you know, it's it's when you're so close to something, sometimes you don't realize what the opportunity is. And I tried to get Emmett to see the future for him and I to take over network solutions, but that wasn't his vision. So it just went by the sideline. Yeah. This, this, this part of the conversation that we're having is one of the reasons I thought it was so important to get you on the show and have you tell this story for our listeners. I think it's it's important for those working in the tech community, especially, but for 
the African-American community more broadly to hear this conversation around playing the long game and seeing opportunities that are right under our noses, right? Rather right. than relying on others to assign value to things on our behalf. That That's what I'm taking away from what you're you're talking about now with the sitting on top of the gold mine and not realizing it was a gold mine until you already sold that that land. That's what I'm hearing. And, and, and yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it, 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 it's interesting. It's, yeah, this is, and, 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 and Malcolm, this is sad to say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm involved with a lot of inventors and a lot of technologists in the African American community. Their stories aren't as big as this, but we have stories of people who have developed technology for major corporations in the African American community who haven't received you know, they're just, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, mediation for, you know, they haven't received the monies and the, the, the all of the things. So, like, when people come to me, they know I've written the book and they know about the history, they'll, they'll tell me the story. I got stories about the brother who helped develop Westinghouse. A lot of people don't know that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, he sold this technology to Westinghouse. And so there's a, there's a lot of things that go on that in history as relates to technology that um you know one one of the inspiring things for me was hidden figures mm-hmm. when the movie mm-hmm. came out i didn't know the story i didn't know the i didn't i, I saw the movie it just happened that i knew the family it was in, incredible yeah. the son in law went to school with me at columbia and i didn't know that and so those are the types of stories that need to come out because we learned something from them. And I know one of your questions is, is why did I write the book? And I really wrote the book so people would be educated on how to make a difference, but also how to make the right decisions at the right time. Hmm. Well, I, here's what I'm thinking about. You were there from the start, right? You were, you were tasked by the federal government to go out there and convince the masses of the internet's potential, which says to me that you had to believe in it at least a little bit in order to be able to sell it. You mentioned that you didn't really see it becoming what it is today, but you you had to know that you had, you had to have had some ideas of what the internet could ultimately be. What has surprised you the most about the way the internet has evolved over the last 30 or so years? I think the, the big thing has been <laughs> just the number of areas the internet had touches. Mm-hmm. You can't. You're, it's really hard to to look at the economy, look at society, and say that the internet has not had an impact on it. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, we're talking about Musk buying one of the biggest internet providers in in the world. Mm-hmm. The town square, know? as he calls it. Exactly, exactly. Influence. So in the in the very beginning, I thought it would be focused on commerce and I thought it would be focused on just knowledge for people, not using the encyclopedia. But the Internet touches everything. Uber, Uber and life would not exist would not the, for not the Internet because you wouldn't have been able to track cars and stuff without the Internet. Yeah. The whole well, me, social social area of what we ha- saw about George Floyd and the young lady taking the picture and having that picture instantaneously go on the internet worldwide. Mm-hmm. And you know when John Lewis died, John Lewis when they interviewed him, he said, "What John Lewis? What what was it that made what you did when you crossed the Pettus Bridge so historical?" And they said, "There was a picture to take it." People could see exactly what happened on the Pettus Bridge. The same thing as it relates to the Internet. The Internet provides that communications network and that view into the Supreme Court, into a lot of other areas that we most likely would have not seen if not for the Internet connection. And that's that's what surprised me, how just ubiquitous this thing is now. This thing is everywhere, okay? So, now, you know, we're talking about metaverse, this this new technology, which they say will replace the Internet. Nah, that, people don't invest in metaverse yet. It's still not proven. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pause you there then, because I know you're a big proponent of things like artificial intelligence and 
machine learning as being a sort of next frontier in the tech space. But if, if, if not for metaverse, then what else do you see out there on the horizon that could make a substantial impact on society and, and might also be an opportunity for those in the tech world to make life changing money like we're talking about? Yeah, the, I, I, I think we haven't exhausted the total communications between individuals at different levels. I think Facebook, yeah, it covers a part. You know, I think there are some other technologies are in the development stage as it relates to tracking, be it, you know, your clothes, be it you. I think that's going to proliferate out there. So the developers who are, are, are thinking about, and this is why I try to get people to think about, think out of the box. If you have a situation where most of your your hard infrastructure retail operations are closing down and people are being um, shifted to go online, virtually anything that they sold in the store, you can sell, sell online. And I see that happening. But I, I don't see it happening as fast in the United States as I see it happening overseas. They're just... Yeah. They're all over it. So those types of things. Where I am right now, and um, which mirrors what the internet was in the early days, is the the whole EV space right now. I think mm -hmm. the auto industry is such a huge industry worldwide, and I really would like to see more minorities participate in the electric vehicle space at some level. I talk to companies all the time. I work for a funding group now, so I'm looking to put money into companies. So I'm looking at, can we be involved in the manufacturing of the EV vehicles or the charging stations? Or at some aspect, in the early stages, we need to accept that EV is going to be with us and we need to have a part of it. It's almost like, I, I, I think back to the internet, that we saw the internet, nobody really saw where it was going, but we know EV, we know where it's going, because you just look at the gas price and you're saying, oh yeah. We're going we're, we're gonna to have a lot, lot more electric cars, but also we, we're going to have that technology in our community. So, well, not I only that, that's what to, I've been to your, yeah. your point, and this is frankly something you've educated me on in the past. It's the government's participation, once again, in making EV adoption more rapid and widespread than it ultimately was going to be if it if left to its own you know natural right. devices and however much promotion Elon Musk can do. So... Can you talk a little bit about that as it pertains to the EV space? Yeah, so the, the federal government and Biden, uh, he just came out with another statement last week about EV penetrating the communities. And this is, this, is, this is interesting because this is the same discussion we had in the early days of the Internet about the digital divide. So in the early days of the Internet, a lot of people were saying, OK, we're going to have the Internet, but will it come to my community? Will my kids be able to utilize the, the technology? Will they be able to pull up books and, and information that they need from school so they can advance in the learning process? And 30 years later, we're still trying to figure out how do we network a lot of these rural and urban communities. So especially today, because we have so much virtual learning going on, Without the internet today, we, we would have a difficult problem in basically educating our society on what should happen at the next level of development. Interesting thing is that South Korea, when the internet started, they made sure that every person in South Korea had access. They put it on the trains, they put it everywhere, because they knew the importance of it. I, I don't know why it, it's, it's so difficult for us to do that. So when I look at EV, yes, the government is involved in promoting EV, but there's got to be some private sector initiatives to get the government to do what they say they're going to do. Mm. And um, so there's like three, I don't know, $3 billion or $4 billion for, for EV development within the urban community, but somebody has got to get the government to basically move that money into those towns and cities where they're going to need to have power stations or charging stations erupted, you know, instructed, constructed, excuse me, in, in those areas so that people will have access to different types of services. If you don't have EV in the future in your community, you may not be able to get deliveries. Hmm. You know, and, you know, you see the situation with Buffalo and the top store and they're saying that they got a, a supermarket that's the only one in the community. Just think about if there is no way for people to charge their truck 
when they come through your community, they won't come through the community. So I guess I'm, I'm trying not to turn this into a political statement, but um, <laughs> I'm, I'm really strong on we need to get on the technologies early. Well, what about uh, talk to me about blockchain then? Same same situation. Yeah, I've I've, I've you know, I, I guess the issue for me is that since I lived through the boom bust period of 2000 and saw people throw money at a technology that wasn't ready yet, I've been hesitant. And one of the lessons I've learned is in the technology space, it's not the first user of the technology, it's generally the second user of the technology. So I think that blockchain's fine, people are talking about it, people are making money, but like the internet, nobody really made big money until the internet failed the first time and people started to develop things around the internet once infrastructure is in place. So that's that's my thing. I, when people come and ask me about that, I just say, I would wait. And that was one of the... That was one of the themes that were firmed up by me reading your book. I read something else that for some reason doesn't doesn't come to my memory immediately. But it, it one of the themes that it talked through was the fact that the pioneers always get their names in the history books, but the settlers come along and make the money. And right, right. <laughs> right, that's right. essentially what I thought about <laughs> reading about uh, network solutions versus SAIC, five million dollars versus twenty one billion, right? The the right. pioneers name now is in your history book, but the the, the settlers SAIC came along and made the real money. Um, right, exactly. But I, I thought it, you know, I just thought it would be a good idea uh to have you talking about two things. I knew you were equally as passionate and and, and dispassionate isn't the word, but equally gung ho and and a little more cautious on just as as you sit at uh, uh, what I consider a, an interesting seat, seeing a lot of the things that people are working on and having people come to you with their ideas and inventions and such for counsel. I, I, I take your point and, and am happy to listen to your your wise counsel on where the the marketplace is, is going. But yeah. So, and that's, so, it, so yeah, let me mention this to Malcolm about the book. And that was the reason I hope you read the section of Lonnie Johnson. He's been an associate of mine, client of mine for 21 years. Mm -hmm. Very interesting story because this is a guy who was told he could never be successful. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that happens in a lot of our communities. He was told he should never think about college. He's one of the most successful inventors. That's Dr. Lonnie Johnson you're talking about, right, exactly. the way, who was told not to go to college. Right, exactly. Do right. Dr. Lonnie Johnson, who owes a master's degree, a uh, PhD and an undergraduate degree, all in engineering, and his products, the Super Soaker for those people who don't know his name, but they know his product, the Super Soaker and the Nerf Gun have exceeded sales of three and a half billion dollars worldwide since the 90s. But I've learned a lot being in, in, his, in his audience and being around him about inventors. And this is a guy that people told him, no, you can't make it. <laughs> and one of the most successful inventors we have in the country and in the world. But you just got to go forward. If you believe in something, you got to at least try and see if it's going to work out. Because the thing about being successful is learning from your failures. And I think that's what's happened in our community is we are not given the opportunity to be a failure. So, and I tell young people, don't, you know, if you fail the first time, just go and get up and Go after it again. Don't don't allow a failure to stop you from what you believe in your heart is something that you think will happen. I'll do some 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 wise words. My so my last question, I feel like I've asked you a ton and I appreciate you being so generous with your time. But my last question to you, uh, maybe sort of a, a, a curveball depends on what answer you come back with. But what is the thing that people ask you the most now that you've put this book out there? Uh, into the universe and people now know you as one of the people who was right there in the moment in the room where it happened to use the to, to use the phrase what's the thing people ask you the most the question people asked me the most was did Al Gore invent the internet <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I, I, I phrased it that way when I threw him in that li long list of inventors in my intro in episode one. I phrased it that way with Al Gore for that, that very reason you're about to get into. Right. So during my research and my discussions with Vince Cerf and some of the other people, he was not the inventor of the Internet, 
but he was person that was instrumental in getting a lot of legislation passed in the Senate that funded the development of the internet in the 90s. And then when he became vice president, he, he basically pushed internet commerce and a lot of other things. So he, he did mm-hmm. play a critical role, but he wasn't the inventor of the internet. The other thing that a lot of people don't know is that the late Ron Brown was mm-hmm. tasked by Clinton to basically write the internet's commercial strategy. He, you know, at that time it was so new, he was basically using technology and information that was out there about the internet to, to write the commercial strategy related to the internet. But that's the that's the the, the biggest question I get. I don't get you know. Uh, the other question you asked about what do you think now, Al, after what you, you see about the Internet? And it's I, I never saw the Internet controlling society as it does today, not even United States, but globally. The Internet is the most powerful technology we have. And I'm surprised we haven't written more or, you know, I've been trying to put, get a documentary produced on it. I Nobody's really talked that much. All they talk about are the problems that the owners have had with the Internet and stuff. So, But the Internet is, is one of the most important technologies of our time. Well, on that note, I genuinely appreciate you spending this much time with us. It has sincerely been an honor. Where can people find you if they want to learn more about you and or pick up a copy of the book after this goes live? So, so the website for the book is... Um, www.race, R-A-C-E, 4, F-O-R, the, T-H-E, book, excuse, net. I'm sorry, race for the net. It's on Amazon. If you want an autographed copy, you can come to uh, raceforthenet.com, and I sell autographed copies. My email is alwhite at raceforthenet.com, or Albert E. White, or Albert White at uh, Polaris. Pefund.com. That's all the information. The book, the book has been widely accepted on Amazon. It's in the top five technology books uh, ever written. Awesome. So, but for those people who want a historical perspective on the internet, I would suggest that you get autographed copies. Awesome. Well, on that note, Eric with an A, why don't you go ahead and close us out, sir? Good. Gentle- gentlemen, this has been fantastic. And, I now know the answer. If anybody brings up Al Gore to me and says, well, <laughs> Al Gore, he, he created the internet. I'll say, you know what? You're, you're half right. It's Al, but it's Albert White. <laughs> right, that right. Is, that's the right Al that is partially responsible. And you got to get that book because, I mean, this is, this is absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. And, and Malcolm said it first, but I'm just going to echo it. You are so generous with your time. Mr. White, thank you so much for being here. Malcolm, of course, we wouldn't be here without you and your your, your decision to create this podcast for educational purposes. Um, what, a, what an amazing glimpse into history we had today. Thank, thank you so much for doing that. Of course, listening audience, we thank you too, because we wouldn't be here without you. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Tech Money Podcast with Malcolm Etheridge. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when Malcolm comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. We humbly ask that you share this podcast and leave a review as this will help others find the show. And this show would be amazing to share, right? Because they're going to learn so much about history and what really happened. Again, you can connect with Malcolm on social at Malcolm on Money. And we'd love to hear from you and answer any questions you have. And you can do so by emailing them to podcast at tech-money.com. Thanks again for listening today. For everyone at Tech Money, our hope is that this show helped make you just a little smarter about your money. This has been the Tech Money Podcast. For more information on today's topic, to review the show notes, or to catch up on past episodes, be sure to check out malcolmetheridge.com slash podcast. And if you have an idea for a show topic that you'd like us to cover, or you want to send us feedback, the web address again is malcolmetheridge.com. You can also find Malcolm across all social media platforms at Malcolm on Money. This episode was written and created by Malcolm Etheridge with the production, the editing and sound controls powered by Proudmouth. This has been a Malcolm on Money original. Thank you for listening. 
The information shared in this recording and by its guests represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not represent the views or opinions of the host. This content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. This content is not, nor is it intended to be a substitute for professional financial advice. It is always recommended that you seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your personal financial situation.